Hey everybody, happy Friday. Welcome back to another uh, episode of Tim Travels. Um, I'm your host, Terry, as always. My sidekick, Beatrice, is here. Um, so, I want to just throw a couple of things out there today. We got some great content um, coming up in future episodes. I want to, uh, want, uh, we're going to do an episode about music um, you know, what people listen to, what I like to listen to, what Tim has told me he likes, and just different things about that. We're also going to talk about, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about how to get exercise when you're on the road, Think little things you can do that makes a, make a big difference that'll help with how you sleep and how you feel, and also um, how your back feels. So, hope you look forward to that. Hope you tune in. Tell your friends. Appreciate our subscribers. Um, so, let's get into talking about uh, a couple of things today. So, first, you know, from the travel aspect, um, you know, we're all in. A lot of us are in the transportation business, and. We're a huge part of what goes on in the economy. But it's always been true that shippers um, or people that made things or had things to sell needed to get their products to market. In other words, needed to get a load from their business to their customer. And the first kind of super highways, if you will, of our nation we're actually on water. You think of the Erie Canal, you think of some of the other canals um, in Ohio and places like that. Well, you know, those barges were towed uh, by mules in a lot of cases. And then steam engines were invented and some of the bigger rivers um, were able to get barge traffic and, and stuff moving via water. And so our country has always been based, a lot of what we've done has been based on our need to move products to market. And I mention that because a lot of times you'll, you know, you'll be driving along and you'll cross a bridge and you're like, oh, that's whatever river. And maybe 50 miles down the road, you cross the same river again. And then 10 miles, cross it again. Six miles, cross it again. 20 miles, cross it again. Well, have you ever wondered why it is that you're crossing the same river multiple times? And a perfect example is the Platte River or parts of the Platte River crossing Nebraska. Um, if you go across 80, you're gonna cross the Platte River or the North Platte River a bunch of times. So, why is that? Well, remember, they were super highways. Now, the Platte River was not, you know, that, that wasn't a river that a lot of commerce moved on. But the reason that we have roads in a lot of places we do is because they were, you know, dirt trails 200 years ago. And we just kept using the same route over and over again because if it was an easy route for a covered wagon to handle then it would be an easy route for you know trucks in in the 40s to handle or trucks in the 20s the interstate system while it's different than the u.s highway system a lot of the routes of the interstate system kind of took over or are literally within a few hundred yards and run parallel to a U.S. highway. And the U.S. highway was probably based on a dirt road from long, long ago. We also tend to build roads in river valleys. Why? Because you don't have to, it, it, it's flatter ground. Um, so when, when you see a river or when you see the Erie Canal or, or some other waterway, remember that those were the original highways. And by the way, 
you know, we're in the transportation business. A surprising amount of stuff still moves by water, by inland water, not just cargo ships out in the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Caribbean, but I'm talking about barges, especially on rivers um, that are tributaries of the Mississippi River. So think the Wisconsin River, Illinois River, um, you know, Missouri River, all leading out to the Mississippi. If you want to think in, in farther east, um, any river that's a tributary of the Ohio. So the Kanawha um, in West Virginia, the Monongahela River um, coming down into Pittsburgh and then picking up the Ohio River, um, Tennessee River, you name it. Those, those are still important ways for cargo to get transported in our country. Um, so we're a, we're a seafaring nation, we're a, a water using nation. Um, and it's just part of our history and it's, it's why a lot of cities are located where they are. So anyway, I just share that with you. Um, little history, little uh, transportation and uh, you know, it's kind of good to realize why we became such a commercial powerhouse in this country. A lot of it has to do with our internal, what they call lines of communications. Um, so anyway, what do we want to talk about today? So I've been thinking about, I, I, I told folks I would talk about um, advertisement that I see, because I read a lot of advertisements for trucking companies. I read the back of, obviously, back a lot of trailers um, where promises are made. But I also read a lot on like Craigslist and who's trying to hire and, and the medium they're using to hire. So one of the things that I've noticed is companies will say, oh, we pay 68 cents a mile. Well, if you read through that, you know, they're, you know they make the same promises. Oh, we have new equipment. We have good dispatchers. Our overnight dispatchers are always available to you. Uh, you get plenty of home time, blah, 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 right? And then somewhere along in there, when you're like, man, 68 cents a mile, that's killing it. You realize that this is a 1099 position. So what that means is that they're going to pay you, but they're not going to, no taxes are going to be taken out. Um, and so that seems appealing for a lot of people. But what I want to do is talk about the comparison between what 1099 means and what W-2 means. And I'm going to talk about it from kind of an accounting and legal perspective. So you as a truck driver or a person who may be thinking about leasing a truck, becoming an owner operator, building a business, what does that mean to you? Both as an individual, but also as a potential business owner. So here's, it, let, let me just share with you what the Internal Revenue Service says about this. Anybody that works for a company is presumed to be an employee unless certain conditions are met. And when those certain conditions are met, then those, pe those people could be deemed independent contractors. Well, the first indicator, or to use a smaller word but more legal, indicia of somebody being an owner operator or an independent contractor is that there's an independent contractor agreement in place. Now, oftentimes that agreement will say, you know, Joe is an independent contractor. He's responsible for his own taxes and, and workman's comp and other, you know, governmental fees for his licensure, et cetera. And, you know, there are certain conditions under which we will use his services and those should be spelled out. But one of the big, sorry about that. One of the big um, 
indicators for the IRS is control. And what I mean by that is that how does the company assign work and who controls how the work is done and assigned? So let's go back to the example I used. If somebody says, hey, we'll hire you as an independent contractor, but you have to drive our truck, tow our trailer. You go on the routes we tell you to, you deliver where we tell you to, you pick up where we tell you to, and um, you take time off when we tell you you can go home. You can get home, go home. That indicates a lot of control. Now, I don't care if they say you're an independent contractor and, and give you a 1099 instead of a W-2. It's probably not going to pass muster. It's probably not going to be in a, a situation that in, indicates an independent contractor. But look at this from a perspective of like how somebody that's leasing does it. If you're leasing with somebody, it's your, you know, you control um, a lot more. You pick the loads you want, you fuel where you want, you are responsible for wear and tear on the equipment. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of things that indicate that you have control. A perfect example is, um, Lyle over at No Hippie Trucking and Transportation. He he's on home time right now if you follow his channel and if you if you don't I recommend that you do. But he's on home time right now. But he picked when he wanted to go home. He went home, he and he routed himself home basically. And he says he's not even sure when he's coming back out. He might take three weeks off. He might take four weeks off. He might take three and a half weeks off. He has a lot of control. And as long as he makes the payment on his truck, Prime, who's the contractor, who he contracts with, is not going to say anything. But if Prime was like, you can't take three weeks off, then that would be exercising a lot of control over what he does. So he has to meet the terms of the contract. Now, if a contract said, we, you know, you're going to work, um, you know, five days a week until the job's done, that might still not be exercising control. That might just be a time on a contract. So what do you give up when you're not a W-2 employee? Now, a lot of people just equate W-2 with paying taxes. Oh, yeah, they uh, withhold my taxes. Well, let me just say this. First of all, the taxes are due whether they're withheld or not. The difference is that somebody that's 1099 has to pay what, what is called self-employment tax. And it's pretty substantial. Um, it, it's a pretty substantial addition to your tax liability. Um, if you... If you're a W-2 employee, you pay income tax at the federal and depending where you live, the state level, and maybe even the local level, depending where you live, and you pay Medicare, um, you know, FICA, the just the, the normal the normal taxes. You're not eligible to participate in a 401k, um, get a 401k match or anything like that, because you're not. A W-2 employee if if you're getting a 1099 so you can't participate in any employer sponsored programs because you're not an employee but the other thing that gets paid in addition to the match that's paid by your employee or employer when you're a W-2 employee they also have to pay workman's comp to the state they pay that that's an insurance that they must have so that if you get hurt on the job, there's some way to cover your expenses and lost wages, etc. Medical expenses is what I'm talking about. The other thing that they pay into is employ uh, unemployment. Um, there's state unemployment and there's also some federal unemployment, which is not a lot, but 
most a lot of businesses pay that. So if you can't work, or let's say that they just say, mm, you know, we're closing our company. We don't need you anymore. And that certainly happens in the trucking industry. Let's say they're a small mom and pop shop. You were a 1099. They say, you know, we're shutting things down. You're out of a job. And let's say for some reason, at that point, you go looking for another job, but you can't get one because let's say they, somebody says, oh, you got to get a new medical card. You got to get renew your physical. And you have really high blood pressure and can't pass the physical. So you can't go to work for them, even though there's lots of jobs in the trucking industry. Well, you're unemployed through no fault of your own. And if you're a W-2 employee, you're entitled to collect unemployment until you find a job or until it runs out, obviously. But if you were 1099, you don't have any backstop. You don't have any safety net. If you got hurt on the job as a 1099 employee, even if it's at their facility, you can't avail yourself of workman's comp. Now, you might be able to sue them, but you can't, you can't just go into a system that's designed to take care of workplace injuries. So there are a lot of considerations that you should have before you take a 1099 position. You may think, oh, I don't want to pay taxes, man. This will be a great way to get out of it. I'll expense stuff. You know, I'll just write it all off. Well, that's a lot easier than, it, you know, it's a lot, it sounds a lot easier, I'm sorry, than it is. The other thing that it does to you is it puts you in a situation where it impacts your ability to do other things that you might want to do, like, say, buy a house. I know from personal experience that being self-employed is a huge hurdle to get over when you're trying to get a mortgage. I've, my wife and I have owned several houses over the years. Even when I was making the most amount of money by a long shot when I was self-employed, I can't tell you how much brain damage it was trying to get a mortgage. So even when I had a bunch of money to put down, um, even when I was in a better financial position than I had ever been, being self-employed was a huge impediment. So before you take a job where you're just focused on, oh, this is how much money I'm going to get, think about the ramifications of being 1099. And, and here's the other thing that I want you to think about. Companies, you know, in the examples that I've used, companies that that say, oh, we're going to pay you a lot more because you're a 1099, even though you, you are definitely not an independent contractor, that company is breaking the law. And you got to ask yourself, if, and, and by the way, these are companies that put this information out on the internet, on Craigslist, right? They're basically waving a flag, and if any IRS agent wants to follow up and just read through all these postings like I do on Craigslist, they'd be like, wait a minute, this company is committing a crime. And my question to anybody that thinks that the 1099 is a good idea and they want to go to that company is, do you really want to work with a company or work for a company that right from Jump Street doesn't want to follow the law. And I don't have an answer for you on that, but I know I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be deemed an independent contractor unless I really was. So I'm happy to answer questions about this. Um, if, if it's more detailed, you know, put it, put it in the comments section so other people can see it. They might be sharing the same thing. Sorry about all the reflection, by the way. Um, and as always, please subscribe, like, and comment, and we'll see you next time. Um, everybody be safe out there.